Byron, Political Works, Oxford Standard Authors. The Poetical Works of Lord Byron. Oxford University Press. Also printed in Glasgow, New York, Toronto, Melbourne, Wellington, Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, Karachi, Lahore, Dhaka, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Cape Town, Salisbury, Ibad, Ibadan, Nairobi, Lusaka, Addis Ababa. The Poetical Works of Lord Byron, London, Oxford, University Press, New York, and Toronto. George Gordon, Lord Byron. Born London, 22 January, 1788. Died, Missolonghi, Greece, 19 April, 1824. This edition of the Poetical Works of Lord Byron was first published in the Oxford Standard Authors series in July, 1904. Reprinted 1906, 1909, 1911, 1912, 1914, 1917, 1921, 1923, 1926, 1928, 29, 33, 35, 39. This reset edition was first printed in 1945 and reprinted in 1950, 52, 57, 59, 60, 61, 64, and 66. Table of Contents. Today we will be starting with Hours of Idleness. A series of poems, original and translated. So this book is just under, or just over, pardon me, this book has 923 pages and this is the last page of the book. It says it's set in Great Britain at the University Press, Oxford, reprinted by Neil and Company Limited, Edinburgh, Scotland. Continuing. Blank. <clears throat> Hours of Idleness. A series of poems, original and translated, first published 1807. Virginibus Perisic, Periscu, Canton, Horace, Lib, III, Ode 1. Menor, Apt, Uc, Uale, Alive, Unite, Till, Velkel. Homer Iliad, X, 249. He whistled and he went for want of thought. Dryden. The preface to the first edition. In submitting to the public eye the following collection, I have not only to combat the difficulties that writers of verse generally encounter, but may incur the charge of, the, of presumption for obtruding myself on the world when, without doubt, I might be, at my age, more usefully employed. These productions are the fruits of the lighter hours of a young man who has lately completed his 19th year. As they bear the internal evidence of a boyish mind, this is, perhaps, unnecessary information. Some few were written during the disadvantages of idleness, of illness, and depression of spirits under the formal influence, childish, Recollections, in particular, were composed. This 
consideration, though it cannot excite the voice of praise, may at least arrest the arm of censure. A considerable portion of these poems has been privately printed at the request and for the perusal of my friends. I am sensible that the partial and frequently injudicious admiration of a social circle is not the criterion by which poetical genius is to be estimated, yet do it greatly. We must. Dare greatly. And I have hazarded by reputation and feelings in publishing this volume. I have passed the Rubicon and must stand or fall by the cast of the die. The cast of the die. In the latter event, I shall submit without murmur for though not without solitude for the fate of these effusions my expectations are by no means sanguine it is probable that i may have dared much and done little for in the words of cowper it is one thing to write what may please our friends who because they are such are apt to be little biased, a little bi biased in our favor, and another to write what may please everybody, because they who have no connection or even knowledge of the author will be sure to find fault if they can. To the truth of this, however, I do not wholly subscribe. On the contrary, I feel convinced that these trifles will not be treated with injustice. Their merit, if they possess any, will be literally al liberally allowed. Their numerous faults, on the other hand, cannot expect that favor which has been denied to others of maturer years, decided character, and far greater ability. I have not aimed at exclusive originality still, less I have studied any particular model for imitation. Some translations are given, of which many are paraphrastic. In the original pieces, there may appear a casual coincidence with authors whose works I have been accustomed to read, but I have not been guilty of intentional plagiarism to produce anything entirely new in an age so fertile in rhyme would be a Herculean task as every subject has already been treated to its utmost extent poetry however is not my primary vocation to divert the dull moments moments of indisposition or the monotony of a vacant hour urged me to this sin. Little can be expected from so unprom un from so unpromising a muse. My wreath, scanty as it must be, is all I shall derive from these productions, and I shall never attempt to replace its fading leaves or pluck in a single additional sprig from groves where I am at best an intruder. Though accustomed in my younger days to rove a careless mountaineer on the highlands of Scotland, I have not of late years had the benefit of such pure air or so elevated a residence as might enable me to enter the lists with genuine bards who have enjoyed both the both these advantages but they derive considerable fame and a few not less profit from their productions while i shall expiate my rashness as an interloper certainly without the latter and in all probability with a very slight share of the former, 
I leave to others. Virum volatere per ora. I look to the few who will hear with patience. Dolce et despierre in loco. To the former worthies I resign, without repining the hope of immortality and content myself with the not very magnificent prospect of ranking amongst the mob of gentlemen who write. My readers must determine whether I dare say with ease or the honor of a posthumous page in the catalog of royal and noble authors, a work to which the peerage is under infinite obligations inasmuch as many names of considerable length, sound, and antiquity are thereby rescued from the obscurity which unluckily overshadows several voluminous productions of their illustrious bearers. With slight hopes and some fears, I publish this first and last attempt to the dictates of young ambition may be ascribed many actions more criminal and equally absurd. To a few of my own age, the contents may afford amusement. I trust they will at least be found harmless. It is highly improbable from my situation and pursuits hereafter that I should ever obtrude myself a second time on the public, nor even in the very doubtful event of present indulgence, shall I be tempted to commit a future trespass of the same nature. The opinion of Dr. Johnson on the poem of a noble relation of mine, that when a man of rank appeared in the character of an author, he deserved to have his merit handsomely allowed, can have little weight with verbal and still less with periodical Censors, but were it otherwise. I should be loth to avail myself of the privilege and would rather incur the bitterest censure of anonymous criticism than triumph in honors granted solely to a title. And a note from up here. The Earl of Carlisle, whose works have long received the meed of public applause to which, by their intrinsic worth, they were entitled. And that was written to the Right Honorable Frederick, Earl of Carlisle, Knight of the Garter, etc., etc. The second edition of these poems is inscribed by his obliged ward and affectionate kinsman, the author, Lord George Gordon Byron. That's all for now. Something to look forward to in the next couple pages. À la prochaine. Until next time.